Good evening, and welcome to the latest installment of Princeton Theological Seminary's Future of American Democracy series. My name is Heath Carter, and I'm the Associate Professor of American Christianity here at the seminary. It's my great pleasure to serve as the convener of this series. For going on a year now, we have been cultivating a rich conversation about the intersection of faith and public life, a conversation that is broad, fair, illuminating and oriented toward truth. The conversation has reflected an unwavering conviction that dialogue across difference in the pursuit of truth can be transformative. And there can be little doubt amid all the uncertainties and compounding crises of our moment that at the level of individuals and communities and massive social structures, transformation is very much in order. This conversation has already featured United States senators and representatives, leading journalists and scholars, major figures in the nonprofit sector and social justice movements, as well as the heads of congregational, denominational, and parachurch ministries. You can check us out at bit.ly forward slash PTS democracy series to catch up on all the discussions to date. Today, following these brief remarks, I have the chance to join you all in the audience. As a good friend and colleague who also happens to be one of Princeton Seminary's most distinguished alums, will be guiding today's conversation. Featuring a guest interviewer with connections to the seminary is something we've been wanting to do from time to time, and this seemed a fantastic opportunity to do so. Our two participants' full biographies are available on the event site, and so I'm going to keep my introductions of them today brief. First, Dr. Lerone A. Martin as the Associate Professor of Religious Studies and the Martin Luther King Jr. Centennial Chair and Director of the Martin Luther King Jr. Research and Education Institute at Stanford University. Last month, he delivered the MLK lecture here at the seminary and we're delighted to partner with him again today. Previously, he was a member of the faculty in the John C. Danforth Center on Religion and po Politics and the Director of American Culture Studies at Washington University in St. Louis. Martin is the author of the award-winning 2014 book, Preaching on Wax, The Phonograph and the Making of Modern African American Religion. Published by NYU Press, the book received the first book award from the American Society of Church History. In his latest book, The Gospel of J. Edgar Hoover, How the FBI Aided and Abetted the Rise of White Christian Nationalism, that one is still hot off the presses from Princeton University Press. In that book, he shares the untold story of how the FBI partnered with white evangelicals to champion a vision of America as a white Christian nation. Today, Dr. Martin will be in conversation with his Stanford colleague, Dr. Condoleezza Rice. Rice is the Tad and Diane Tobe Director of the Hoover Institution and a Senior Fellow on Public Policy. She is the Denning Professor in Global Business and the Economy at the Stanford Graduate School of Business. In addition, she is a founding partner of Rice, Hadley, Gates, and Manuel LLC an international strategic consulting firm. From January 2005 to January 2009, Rice served as the 66th Secretary of State of the United States, the second woman and first black woman to hold the post. Rice also served as President George W. Bush's assistant to the president for national security affairs from January 2001 to January 2005, the first woman to hold the position. Rice served as Stanford University's provost from 1993 to 1999, during which time she was the institution's chief budget and academic officer. As professor of political science, she has been on the Stanford faculty since 1981 and has won two of the university's highest teaching honors. She has authored and co-authored numerous books, most recently, To Build a Better World, Choices to End the Cold War and Create a Global Commonwealth in 2019, co-authored with Philip Zelikow. Without further ado, I'm gonna hand the mic over to Dr. Martin, I look forward to seeing where the conversation goes. Thank you. Thank you for joining us. Condig, it's good to be with you. Great to be with you too. So let's get started. You have deep roots in the Presbyterian Church. Your grandfather, Reverend John Wesley Rice Sr., graduated from Stillman College, um, a historically black university founded by the Presbyterian Church. Your father, Reverend John Wesley Rice Jr., Graduated from Johnson C. Smith University, another historically black college founded by the Presbyterian Church. Then your father pastored a Presbyterian church in Birmingham, Alabama, before becoming dean at Stillman College. So 
Tell me what that was like growing up in that environment. It must have been like a way station of African-American clergy and thought leaders of the day. Well, first of all, thank you very much for having me, and thank you to Princeton uh, Theological Seminary, and thank you also for uh, getting uh, Lerone educated so he could be here at Stanford. <laughs> we love having you as a colleague. Thank you. Well, my Presbyterian roots, in fact, run very, very deep, and uh, I would make really two points. The first is that for us, uh, the religious experience and education were always linked. Yes. And I think for a lot of African-American culture, that is true. Uh, the story is that my grandfather actually wanted to go to college. He kept asking how a colored man could go to college. He was mm -hmm. a sharecropper's son. So they told him about Little Stillman College, saved up his cotton, went there. Mm -hmm. After a year, they said, well, do you have any more money to pay for your second year? He said, well, I don't have any money. They said, well, you're out of luck. And he said, but how are those boys going to college? They said, well, they have what's called a scholarship. And if you wanted to be a Presbyterian minister, you could have a scholarship too. And granddaddy said, that's exactly what I had in mind. <laughs> and so my family has been educated and Presbyterian ever since. But yeah. he and my father and others would go on to be sure that the church was not just a place for Sunday service, particularly in segregated Birmingham. It was the center of social life in yes. many ways. The, the ladies of the church with their teas and uh, their wedding receptions. But also my father would have tutors come to the church on Tuesdays wow. uh, from Ullman High School where he was a guidance counselor to tutor in algebra and math. And on Wednesdays we had French lessons. And so it was uh, the church, particularly in the South, was just so much the center of our lives. Mm -hmm. But it was the center not just of our religious life, but of our education, educational life as, as well. And I've often said in, in Little Titusville in Birmingham, it was faith, family, and education in, uh, in that order. Growing up in Birmingham, um, you grew up there in a very transformative time. We are now marking 60 years since the Birmingham campaign, of which you were there, your family. Yeah. And at a time when Birmingham was in many ways the center of the civil rights movement and Martin Luther King Jr.'s campaign there. And as a result of some of the pushback to that campaign, Birmingham became known as Bombingham. And you talk a great deal about this in some of your writing. And you experienced that not just as an observer, but personally. You lost a playmate, right. Denise McNair, right. um, there in the bombing of the 16th Street Church. Right. Can you say a little bit about how you have and perhaps maybe continue to wrestle with that experience? Well, in uh, being a little girl, eight years old in Birmingham when it was Bombingham, it was uh, pretty frightening. And yeah. I, I remember that Sunday at my father's church, and uh, it was about two miles as the as the crow flies from 16th Street Baptist Church. And it was a kind of shudder. And wow. in those days, everybody knew it was a bomb that had gone off someplace. And as the names uh, of the little girls started to come forward, Cynthia Wesley, Addie Mae Collins, Denise McNair, everybody knew one of those little girls. As a matter of fact, Addie Mae Collins was in my uncle's homeroom at uh, Burnetta C. Hill Elementary. Wow. So it was a deeply personal. Yes. Uh, affair. Uh, it was frightening if you were a child. But our parents were remarkable because even through the toughest of times, they would say, uh, you know, you, you have to be twice as good. Mm -hmm. uh, they were just taking it on head on that uh, you were going to be able to overcome. Mm -hmm. And I never felt that I couldn't achieve because I was in segregated Birmingham. Now, to be fair, I grew up in a community that was highly educated. I yes. think, as a matter of fact, I think everybody taught school. I think there was <laughs> one lawyer, one doctor, everybody else taught school. But uh, that 63 was, 1963, was really just an inflection point. Uh, I think one of the things that's not really well understood about the 60s, and uh, you and I had this conversation, mm -hmm. My father, um, I remember him talking to my mother, and uh, the marches were going on and so forth, and he said, I'm not going to go out there and pretend to be nonviolent. Mm. He said, because if somebody raises a billy club to me, and you know, the police, Bull Connors police yes. were doing exactly that, he said, I'm going to try to kill him. He said, and my daughter's going to be an orphan, so I'm not going to do it. Mm. My father, like many people, was actually more attracted to the black power movement. Mm -hmm. 
and to the sense that it was in our own hands. We had to take it into our own hands. And so one of our closest family friends um, was Stokely Carmichael. After my dad moved to, to Tuscaloosa to be dean of students at Stillman College, in uh, 1967, he invited Stokely Carmichael to speak at Stillman. And no other black college had done that. And I remember the sheriff, who was white, coming mm. to our house and saying, now, Reverend, this is going to be okay, right? He said, I don't want to stir up those boys down south. This is going to be all right. And my father said, yes, it'll be just fine. And then he left, and my father said, I sure hope it's going to be just fine. <laughs> but in fact, um, Stokely, who was one of the greatest orators I've ever known, yeah. uh, became a family friend because these two streams in uh, African-American intellectual yes. thought yes. Uh, were often crisscrossing in the 60s. Some of it was about asserting ourselves. Some mm -hmm. of it was about changing the laws. And I think we've gotten to a place that we don't respect how complex yes. the African-American intellectual tradition is and, uh, and, and certainly was at that time. Absolutely. And let me just uh, stick with that for a second about this complexity. Mm -hmm. You witnessed it firsthand. Mm -hmm. You've talked about in your writing seeing your father on the porch talking and debating with Reverend Fred Shuttlesworth. That's right. Fred Shuttlesworth and your father, great friends, saying to your father in some ways, you need to come out and participate in this, and your father saying no. Yeah. How do you think watching that as yeah. a little girl yeah. begin to form you and your, uh, your intellectual life? Well, it certainly introduced me to complexity early on. Yeah. And, mm -hmm. uh, and my father was a theologian, Mm -hmm. of course, and he liked to debate, and we would debate these things. <laughs> and um, I'll come back to, to Reverend Fred Shuttlesworth, who was one of his really dear friends, and, and a sometimes forgotten figure in mm -hmm. the Birmingham movement. Uh, he led the Birmingham movement. And uh, so my dad gave a sermon one day, and um, I came home, I was about f four or five years old, and I said, Daddy, you mispronounced that man's name the whole time. What are you? His name is Job, very often. You, you kept calling him something else. So we would debate religion. We would debate politics. I was encouraged to make my views known. I was encouraged to listen to alternative views. Um, I can remember when we moved to Denver, my dad invited Stokely to the University of Denver. Mm -hmm. And my dad had this, this series called The Black Experience in America. And he said it's a, it was a, a Monday night course two units for the students. You didn't have to do anything but show up. He said, this is an attitude change class. And so we had Stokely Carmichael, we had Fannie Lou Hamer, we had wow. Dick Gregory, we had Louis Farrakhan. Wow. We had all of these speakers because my dad believed in intellectually mixing it up. Okay. And so I learned to intellectually mix it up and I think somehow we're starting to lose that. I, I agree with you. Some of these figures that you named are very prominent, and we still wrestle with them today, their ideas. Yeah. Can you uh, pinpoint one particular figure, theologian, religious thinker, that's really been influential for you in your personal and professional life? Um, I know so many have mentioned Reinhold Niebuhr. He's been yes, a great yes, uh, buzz, Niebuhr, but yes, I'm wondering right. if... Well, um, I think that for me, um, you know, People who can uh, bring today's religion into focus, yes. not to just take on what today's issues are. So Tim Keller has been someone that mm. I read and find uh, really, really uh, encouraging. Uh, mm. There was a minister who was actually my pastor at uh, Menlo Church here in California. His name is John Ortberg. Yes, he wrote a book called Who Is This Man yes. About Jesus Christ? And uh, because I think in the Presbyterian tradition, in other traditions too, but particularly in the Presbyterian tradition, I felt this admonition that it was also about your mind. It yeah. was your mind and your soul yes. and your heart yes. that you had to think. My father said once that uh, a couple of his elders said to him, Reverend, you make us think before we feel. <laughs> and my father said, I wasn't sure that that was a, you know, was supposed to be a compliment or not, but <laughs> that, willingness to struggle yeah. with our faith, our willingness to struggle with what our faith means for us today, what it means for each and every one of us as we 
a uh, act. Yes. Uh, people who've been able to access the scriptures in that way for me have been in many mm. ways the most influential. And I can attest to the, the Presbyterian way of, of both heart and mind as being a student from Princeton Seminary. Yeah. And that's yeah. one of the things that struck me. I remember being there was how that mixture came about. Yes, I, yes. I can recall. Right. So in addition to the 60th anniversary of Birmingham, we were also marking the 20th commemoration uh, of the Iraq War. Yeah. Something that um, I know that you've talked about a lot, but I'm wondering if you could reflect on a little bit with us today um, about it in hindsight, about what did it accomplish? What can we as a nation, as people of faith, learn from it? Yeah. And maybe what are some of the unattended consequences? Yes. Well, the first thing is to recognize um, that uh, the Iraq War was not about, quote, bringing democracy to Iraq. Mm -hmm. It was a security problem. And, and you have to put this in the context of September 11th. Yes. So I was National Security Advisor on September 11th. We missed it. Mm -hmm. The intelligence community missed it. And from that moment on to this very day, I have great remorse mm -hmm. about the 3,000 people who lost their lives on my watch because we didn't see it coming. Mm -hmm. And if you're in that frame, you aren't likely to let security uh, problems or security challenges just fester. And we'd had a security problem with Saddam Hussein since 1991 when the first Gulf War had ended. And mm -hmm. we believed that he was rebuilding his weapons of mass destruction. It was a very opaque society, and you couldn't tell fully what was going on. And so we decided it was time to do something about that. Uh, as mm -hmm. it turns out, the intelligence was not right. And I've been asked, well, would you have told the president, would you have advised the president to do it if you'd known there were no uh, extant weapons of mass destruction? Well, you can't know today. Uh, what, what you know today can't affect what you did yesterday. But I find it hard to believe that, in fact, we would have if we had thought the threat less imminent. But what makes me uh, really angry sometimes is that people think we were looking for a reason to go to war. Right. I can tell you, no American president wants to go to war. They know the cost. They're the ones who go to the funerals. They're the ones who comfort the widows. They're the ones who visit the military hospitals. And so they don't want to go to war. So mm -hmm. in retrospect, what have we accomplished? Well, I will still say I think the world is better off without Saddam Hussein. And Iraq's very fragile democracy now doesn't put its people in mass graves. He put a million people in mass graves. They don't uh, threaten their neighbors. They don't support terrorists. And they don't try to build weapons of mass destruction. And so as fragile as that is, I think the Iraqi people have a better government than they had in the past. If I contrast with, with Afghanistan, I'm sorry that the women that we helped empower for 20 years yeah. in Afghanistan are now back under the rule of the Taliban. Yeah. You ask unintended consequences. You know, perhaps we were too ambitious in not just taking out Saddam and leaving some general in power and leaving. But we thought that it made sense to try to give the Iraqi people uh, a, an opportunity, a chance. And I do think the Middle East is changing in important ways. Um, I think that you're starting to see women take a rightful place in, in the Middle East. And uh, these things have a long, long, long tail, not a short one. And so we'll see where we are in a few years. As you know, speaking of intelligence, as you know that I've, um, I've written about some of the failures of mm -hmm. um, the intelligence community here on the domestic uh, sphere, yes. especially with uh, the FBI and its partnership with faith communities and um, crushing dissent and um, this campaign against Martin Luther King Jr. Yeah. What do you think, um, as a society, we can learn from some of those less than noble histories? Well, I think you always learn from history that um, Abuse of power is always a possibility because human beings are by no means perfect. Yes. And so you always need to make sure that particularly intelligence agencies are overseen properly, that they understand uh, their limitations, right. and uh, that somebody's not just paying attention but isn't trying to use them in right. a weaponized way. That's right. 
Um, I'm a little concerned even in recent years. Uh, we have some issues around how to think about what you see on the internet. Yes. When can you act against somebody who clearly might be a danger to the larger society? Right. How much should intelligence be able to go into the private space yes. of uh, citizens? The, the founders wouldn't have imagined that right. uh, you would have uh, websites and games devices. that you could look at, devices. Right. So, right. so it's not exactly a constitutional issue. But it is an issue of what's the proper balance between our privacy and our security. Mm -hmm. I think that we, as a democratic society, at least have a chance of balancing those. And I would say that we try to balance it across the three branches of government. So the president of the United States is always going to be more concerned about security. Yeah. Right? I don't care who he is. If you don't believe that, constitutional lawyer Barack Obama keeps an awful lot of the Bush administration's war on terror. Mm -hmm. Because that's, that's his, he's got to protect the country. If you think about the Congress, they can authorize and reauthorize legislation on behalf of the people. So the Patriot Act from uh, 2001 has been reauthorized with limitations being put on it each time. And then finally, it is the courts that mm -hmm. decide constitutionality. And I do remember telling my European colleagues when they were talking about the treatment of terrorists that when, um, their, when Osama bin Laden's driver can sue the Secretary of Defense of the United States of America before the American Supreme Court and win on questions of habeas corpus, I think we're doing okay. And in fact, that mm -hmm. happened in mm -hmm. Hamden versus Rumsfeld, where Osama bin Laden's driver won his case on habeas corpus. So w our institutions are pretty powerful. Okay. We just have to make sure that they're working. And they clearly failed in the, the constraints, clearly failed in the cases that you've studied and yeah. written about. Given the, the branches of government and their role in helping to constrain intelligence, what do you think about educational institutions and what we can do about um, our democratic institutions. For example, you lead a center here, an institute here, the Hoover Institute, I lead an institute here. What do you think and how, how are you thinking about the, our role as a learning community in helping to fix and address some of these concerns about our democratic institutions? Well, I would start by hoping that we, uh, you and I are both professors, yes. uh, that we help our students first understand them. I, I love our mm. kids. Yes. You know, I, they're the most public-minded generation I've taught. They are. But they're in a hurry. They are. <laughs> and sometimes I want to say, okay, let's know something before you change the world. So it's our job Great to point. educate. And uh, I just was, I was despondent to read just a couple of days ago that our national uh, test, our national test scores on civics yes, and history down. are down. So yes. before you can decide how you want to change an institution, you actually have to know its history. You have That's to right. know when it's functioned well and when it hasn't. That's right. Uh, the American Constitution, uh, clearly my ancestors, your ancestors, in its inception were three-fifths of a man so that we could form the United States. That's that right. hangs over us as a birth defect yes, of the Constitution. And yet, if you look back to the Civil Rights Movement, it wasn't just about the streets of Birmingham and Selma. It wasn't even just about the legislation. It was about the courts. Right. We know that, uh, that the NAACP and people like Thurgood Marshall and others would sit around, you know, the Margot Report, they would sit around. They'd decide where they were going to take a case and where they might win, where they might lose. So they used those institutions in a very powerful way to progress the rights of descendants of slaves, something I think that would have been not even thought of 100 years before. Correct. So uh, first understand them, then resolve to use them, and uh, recognize that if you don't understand them and don't resolve to use them, they will wither. That's right. And then what are you left with? That's right. We're speaking to a broad audience, but certainly um, our colleagues at Princeton Theological Seminary. What role do ministers play in those training for ministry? What role do they play in helping our democratic institutions? Remembering first and foremost that one of the first rights was the right to religious freedom. That's right. It means that at the core, 
um, America has a commitment to the importance of conscience, uh, to the importance of people being able to worship as they please. Right. And I've been in many a country and studied many a country where that can't be taken for granted. Mm. Um, I, I will never forget around going, uh, I, I never miss Holy Week services. Uh, I'm a minister's kid, you just don't you miss don't do Holy that. Week That's services. Right. <laughs> and I happened to be in China uh, on a Palm Sunday. And I thought, well, I just gotta go to church. And so uh, they said, your Secretary of State, you can't go to these underground churches, right? You can't do that. I said, okay, fine. So I went to an official church. And I thought, I felt a little guilty for being in an official church, you know, mm -hmm. one that was sponsored by a regime that clearly did not believe in religious freedom. Right. But then when I saw those people who were worshiping there, and mm -hmm. I saw the looks on their faces, you could tell they were believers. Wow. And so it reinforced for me how important it is for all of us to realize the importance of our spiritual nature. That's right. To understand that human beings crave to know that there's something bigger than themselves. Yes. And that we need to understand our religion, we need to study it, we need to teach it. Uh, I've, as I've said, we need to challenge it. Yes. And then we have to understand how we intend to act on it in yeah. our daily lives. Um, my dad was, um, you know, my mom was the, was a musician and she was the minister of music at yes, the church. Yes. So we spent a lot of time at the church because between choir practice and all of the things that were going on at the church, we just went there a lot. And uh, my dad um, would write these sermons that were really, really challenging. He did one, one Sunday. Let's look at this from the, from the uh, uh, viewpoint of Judas. Now, at wow. his little Presbyterian church in Birmingham, <laughs> it's like, we're going to do what, Reverend? Right? Wow. So he was always challenging, challenging yeah. and I think we need to do that. But then we need to recognize that religious rights and cultural norms do sometimes conflict. Yes. Um, that we have institutions that try to bring those uh, into harmony. Sometimes it takes some time. Yeah. Uh, you know, I am delighted that the United States of America has finally come to the understanding that who you marry and who you love should be your own business. I agree. Amen. That's a huge step forward for yes. us. And you could have had religious people saying, well, that's not what the Bible said, and you did have people doing Absolutely. that. And we still do. And we still do. That's right. But the great majority of society thinks of it another way, and I certainly think of it as another way as a religious person, which was Jesus loved everybody. This is, mm -hmm. you know, kind of not for me to, to judge. And oh, by the way, my best friends uh, happen to be a married um, couple, um, gay couple. And so it helps too when we start to know each other. Mm -hmm. And so one of the things that I think our religious experience can do, and we don't do too well, is we can bring uh, populations that otherwise would not be in contact with one another more into contact with one another. Somebody I said that the that. most segregated hour yes. in America is 11 o'clock on Sunday. Martin King said that, yeah. yes. And so um, I think we need to think about that. And again, I'll just tell you about my dad. So my Please. dad, my dad um, you know, segregated Birmingham. And he and the pastor of, of Shades Valley Presbyterian, which was the white church over in Mountain yeah. Brook, decided they'd have a youth group meeting together. This is 1962. Wow. Well, they tried it once and uh, <laughs> families <laughs> decided not such a great idea. Yeah. But then he said that the, um, the synagogue, uh, you know, they don't have services on Sunday. Suppose I take my kids over there and let the rabbi tell them about Judaism. So he did. We need more of that wow. so that we can not just understand what our own religion should mean for us, yeah, right. but also better understand other religions because there is, uh, there can be a, a, a stay with your own tribe uh, character to religion mm -hmm. sometimes. Wow. So, you know, thinking about again about growing up in Birmingham, one of the things um, you, you mentioned today and you've written about your parents told you that you had to be twice as good. And I recall an extraordinary, ordinary people 
you wrote about trying out to be the first African American uh, pianist right. um, at a particular school yes. in Alabama, and you said, "Mom and Dad, I'm I'm nervous," right. and they were shocked by this. Yes. And they said, "Why are you?" Sh and you said, "Because I feel like I have to be twice as good." Right. And you say, "To your surprise, they said." You do. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> they didn't right. say no. They didn't say no. No, Condi, no. no honey, it's no. okay. Just no. do your best. They no. said you do. You do. Yeah. I, I'm wondering if you could talk about that experience and relate it to today because we're in a we're in a moment in this country where a great deal has changed. Yeah. You've witnessed it, you've lived it. But we still have, as you call what you said earlier, what I like the way you said it, a birth defect yeah. of racism in this country. Right. So how do you think about that now, being raised with parents who told you you had to be twice as good, right. to a generation today who says, that's not fair, right? right. This burden, we still have to carry it. Yes. So I'm wondering how you think about that today. Well, in, in, a, in a funny way, we didn't accept it as a burden. We kind mm. of thought of it as a challenge, right? <laughs> Interesting, okay. So um, they, they didn't say, by the way, oh, it's such a pity that you have to be twice as good, or it's so unfair that you, have, you just have to be twice as good. So you went around trying to be twice as good, confident, that meant you work twice as hard. Mm. And so I actually tell all of my students, I don't care what color they are, try to be twice as good, mm. right? So I actually don't like the idea. Life is not fair. We all come from different circumstances, different. America is not gonna be colorblind for maybe our lifetimes. Mm. I just wanted to act like it is. I just don't want somebody to walk in and you assume you know what they're capable of or how they think. Right. Um, you're gonna see color, I understand that. But don't suddenly start to think, well, that person can't, or can't, can't. Just reserve judgment until you've, until you've seen what they can do. And I think that would help us a great deal. Yeah. But on the other side, if you are uh, an underrepresented minority, if you are on the other side, um, I sometimes think giving others the benefit of the doubt helps. Yeah. Um, you know, yeah, maybe somebody says something that you wish they hadn't said or it's kind right. of insensitive or, uh, I do tell my students, you don't have a constitutional right not to be offended. <laughs> so if somebody offends you, why don't you talk to them about right. it, tell them it was offensive. Uh, right. I'd like us all right. to be more of this common project of um, an environment in which everybody's respected and yeah. everybody can succeed. Absolutely. And we have to go both ways. The other thing that I often say to, um, to my underrepresented minority students and, and to my female students, by the way, yeah. is uh, yes, you might walk into a room and somebody might look at you like, are you in the right meeting? Happened to me a lot. I'm gonna ask, I'm yeah, sure. Yeah, a lot. I was a specialist <laughs> on international security and Soviet affairs. You don't think they thought I was in the wrong meeting? Yes. But I thought, you know, they're gonna figure out I'm in the right meeting pretty soon. And right. so I'm just not gonna let this get my blood pressure up, because that's just. Right. And my dad told me something once that was really mm -hmm. helpful. We had moved to Denver, and I went from totally segregated school in Birmingham to St. Mary's Academy, which had three black women in my class. Mm -hmm. And um, somebody had not wanted to sit next to me because I was black. Mm -hmm. And I went home and I said this to my father, and he said, that's just fine, as long as they move. Mm. And I thought, you're telling me don't let their racism right. be my problem. Be your problem, that's right. So we all need to work for a more just world. We have to work for a world in which you don't have to be twice as good. Right. We need to work toward all those things, but in the meantime, while we're getting there, if you are waiting for somebody to overcome their racism so you can succeed, you might be waiting for quite a long time. Wow. And we've all had to overcome something at mm -hmm. some point in time. Um, and I, I always said, um, uh, my parents taught me that there may be a barrier there, go over it, around it, or through it, but don't stand in front of it. Mm -hmm. I like that. Let me ask a question about um, professional ethics. We are in a moment right now where a number of our public officials are under scrutiny um, for concerns about their, um, shall we say, moral compass or yeah. ethics. Yeah. Can you talk to us a little bit about that as a professional in public life? Um, 
how have you maintained or what what mechanisms or books or quotes or ideas that you have that you use as a moral compass as you navigate professional life? Well, I do try to use my faith in that way and to ask for guidance. Um, most of the time, I haven't found that it was uh, that I was having to worry about something that was against my ethics or against my values. Sometimes it's competing values. Hmm. So uh, if you are about to try to take out a terrorist camp, you know some civilians are going to die. Right. But if you don't take out the terrorist camp, even more civilians are going to die. Hmm. That's a dilemma. Yes. It's not one value is right and the other is wrong. It's a dilemma. So very often I found in policymaking that was the way. Mm -hmm. But when it came to ethical issues, um, people used to say, can it pass the New York Times test? In other words, <laughs> if you saw it in the New York Times, would you do it? I always said, no, 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 that's not my test. My test is if my mother found out. There you go. Right? There you, you, go. Know? There you go. So as long as you are asking yourself, if my mother found out, mm -hmm. uh, I think you'll... If, particularly from the background that um, I come from. And the one I come from And as the well. one you come from that's as right, well. Right. And probably the one an awful lot of people come from. Yeah. Uh, that's hmm, I like that's that. a good test. I like that. And, af and after, this, after we do this, I'm sure that my mother will let me know if I, uh, if I <laughs> find the test. So that's really helpful. Let me ask a question about something else that's been in the news. Um, Second Amendment and guns. Yeah. You have written about, um, even in Extraordinary, Extraordinary Ordinary People, you've written about your father, a minister, yeah. who got with other men in the neighborhood right. and set up a very formalized, regimented patrol to That's protect right. your neighborhood. That's because right. literally, as you said, as a crow flies, you heard bombs. Right. You came home right. from having dinner with your family. You hear a bomb going right. off. It's bombing him. And you say because of this experience, you are an advocate of the Second Amendment. Mm -hmm. Help us to think about as a person of faith, I mean, how are we to think about the Second Amendment as well as all the concerns we have today with mass shootings yeah. and, um, and, and assault rifles and things of this, yeah. of this nature? Well, I, I don't believe that the Bill of Rights is, is divisible, all right? We'll okay. keep the First Amendment but not the Second, okay. so let's okay. start there. Okay. But uh, I do think we can have common sense discussions about uh, what could make us safer yes. and keep the Second Amendment um, in, 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 uh, intact. Yes. So, for instance, no, I do not believe that Americans need military weapons. <laughs> I, I don't understand why any civilian has to have a military weapon. I completely agree. Uh, I have been around military. I know what they can do. Yes. Uh, there really isn't any reason to protect your house that you need a military weapon. So could we start there? Uh, multiple magazine weapons. Uh, that's probably something that we ought to be willing to, to, uh, to look at. Uh, we already do background checks, but obviously, and it goes back to another point that we talked about, you know, some of these people clearly have shown in their, uh, their social media and the like that Correct. they are problems. So are we getting on these problems uh, early enough, and then there is a mental health problem out there. Yes. And I think the COVID experience has Absolutely. maybe deepened people's sense of, uh, of isolation yes. and doom. It, it, it strikes me that almost always when you hear about the mass shooter, well, he was quiet. You know, he was a yeah. loner. Yeah. And so yeah. somehow some combination of some sensible things that we could do within the context still of the Second Amendment, um, Plus, understanding what is driving people to do things like this, I think might yeah. start to get us there. Yeah. Uh, but yeah. we've got to be able to have the conversation, and, and we, we can't just yell at each other about it. Um, I think people are getting to the place that they'd like to see if there isn't something we can do. Right. I agree, 100%. Yeah. Let me ask one more question. Um, this is a series that we're having this discussion, uh, part of a series about the future of democracy. Can we conclude our time together um, hearing from you about what you think are some of the greatest threats and opportunities to democracy and democratic institutions, both at home and abroad? Yes. I'm very often asked, why does democracy fail? Hmm. I actually think the question is, why does democracy succeed? Right. right? It's hard. It's hard work. When you think about this kind of really naive, almost, almost naive late 18th century idea that people could self-govern through these yes. 
uh, abstractions called institutions, elections and constitutions and the like, right. and, and they could uh, pursue happiness through them and they could preserve their freedoms through them. And you think about how limited that franchise was, 13 states, white right. mill landowners, but over time we've extended it and expanded yes. it and yes. we the people has come to mean more and more of That's us. Right. Right. And so the pressures on these institutions get to be more and more and yet they kind of hold up because um, Americans really do believe that the Constitution is their personal protector. Mm. They will go, take you all the way to the Supreme Court if you violate it, their rights. There is no other country in the world where individual citizens have that relationship with the Constitution. Mm. And so we have something to work with. Yes. But I will quote my uh, great friend, the late George Schultz, who lived to be 100 years old, and he would wear a tie. He would say, democracy is not a spectator sport. And so when we talk about the threats to democracy, the biggest threat to democracy is that we don't do anything about what we consider to be the threats to democracy. Mm. And I, again, say to my students, you know, get involved somehow. Work yes. on a campaign. Go work for a mayor. Go yes. Somehow get involved in the democratic enterprise. So one is apathy, that yeah. people begin to think, well, these institutions are not for me. Uh, either they're so soiled by their past or they're so elitist, they're not for me. That's one danger. Yeah. A second big danger, I think, is the technology, which is just, uh, you know, I, I love the technology, but yes. you know, the founders kind of didn't think about social media and the impact right. or, or right. the fact that we could go into our own uh, echo chambers yes. and only listen to people who agree think with that agree with us. That's I right. think that's another danger to democracy. I think there's another danger to democracy, which is that too many people are now left out of the grand bargain mm. that you will be able to have the skills and yes. the education, the things that we've talked about yes. that will allow you to succeed no That's matter right. where you came from. Right. I often say uh, the, the Americans are not actually linked by ethnicity, nationality, or religion. So what is it? You, it doesn't matter you, where you came from, matters right. where you're going. So right. that promise, you know, that human capital has right. got to be restored. No more third graders who can't read. That's right. No more 20 year olds with a college degree and a lot of debt and no skills. I mean, we just have to fix Absolutely. that problem. And then finally, I would say um, that uh, we somehow have got to realize uh, that we don't know each other very well anymore. No, we don't. Um, at the 20, after the 2016 election, I actually heard some of our colleagues saying, you know, I think I'll go to Alabama and see what those people think. <laughs> if you have to do an anthropological <laughs> dig on your <laughs> fellow citizens, we've got a problem. So I have actually been a, in favor of perhaps national service, uh, voluntary even. Mm. Um, I had kids who went to Teach for America, and I remember one, one kid, he was from Connecticut, he was as blonde as the day is long, and I said, so where are you going for Teach for America? He said, the Mississippi Delta. I thought, oh boy, are you wow. about to have an experience? Yes. But getting people to places that they otherwise wouldn't be so that yes. we get to know each other, because we don't have that many common experiences anymore. Um, and so I think there are some ways to address uh, these issues. Uh, when I think worldwide, I still think as hard as we have it, as difficult as it is, the United States of America has still tried to deal with difference, particularly since in the last 60 years or so, better than any place on earth. Um, we haven't done it perfectly by any means. But oh my goodness, when I look at how we struggle with it and how we think about it and how, I think we have tried to deal with it. I'll, t I'll tell you a little story to close. So I was Please. with the Brazilian president, uh, his first term, President Lula, and uh, he asked me about race in America. Yeah. And if you remember, Brazil used to say it didn't have a race problem. Yes, they did. However, all the field hands were African, mm -hmm. all the hotel staff were mulatto, yes. and the government yes. was Portuguese. That's right. And he had recognized this. And I, 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 you know, I, I, I know he was, a, he was a man of the left, supposedly. But I was so impressed with how he wanted to change this yeah. element of his yeah. country. And so when he uh, appointed Brazil's first Afro-Brazilian minister, 
I got a call from the foreign minister saying, would you come to Salvador Bahia and do a program with him? Salvador Bahia is the Africa, yes. Afro-Brazilian yes. homeland. So I went to Salvador Bahia. We did a program. The people were lining the streets. Uh, there was a church there that had been built by slaves. It had taken them 100 years to build it because they could only do it in their spare time. Right. And that night, we had this beautiful, uh, dinners for secretaries of state are usually really boring affairs. <laughs> well, the, the Brazilians know how to have a dinner, mm -hmm. and Gilberto Gil was there to play, and wow. we danced in the warm night, and I thought, these people know how to have a great time. <laughs> but I thought of that, and I thought of the other places that the African diaspora has spread. Mm. And in some ways, what happens to the African diaspora in America has to be a good symbol and a good bellwether for what happens everywhere else. Mm. And so it is a kind of special responsibility to get it right here yes. because the world's watching. Mm. I love that. Let me ask one last thing and yeah. we'll go. We're talking about social media. If you could send 10-year-old Kandi a tweet, <laughs> yeah. what would it be? Because this program you just mentioned in Brazil is still going on. I've yes. just read about it in the news. Yes. You have lived and are living an impactful life. Right. So what would you tell your 10-year-old self? I would tell my 10-year-old self, it's going to be okay. You don't have to be a music major after all. <laughs> <laughs> thank you for your time. It's been a pleasure. pleasure. Thank, thank you. Thank you very you. much. And thank you for joining us. Thank you. Thank you.